The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. I want to talk to us about conviction of the Spirit. We think about conviction. Conviction of the Spirit is something that we have all experienced. All of us have experienced the conviction of the Spirit. He shows us that we're guilty before God and we need to do something about it. That's what conviction is all about. Conviction, we think about it as being bad. But conviction has both a negative and a positive side. The negative side says you dirty old rat, you need to get right with God. You're going to die in your sin and go to hell. You need to change your way of living. But the positive side says you can be convicted and you can do what's right. You can live for the Lord. You can stay straight. You can stay right. You can live a holy life. And God wants us to live a holy life. So there's a positive and a negative side to conviction. We think about conviction as being bad, but it isn't. Because conviction is what keeps us in the right way. Conviction is always meant to bring us into right standing and relationship with God. That's what we need to remember about conviction. It's not meant to put us down. It's not meant to make us feel bad. And sometimes conviction does make you feel bad. All of us, you can bear me witness that when you came to the Lord, before you came to the Lord, conviction made you feel bad because you were not living right. You were not living for the Lord. And you needed to straighten up. You needed to let God get a hold of your life and change your heart. And so conviction, it makes you feel bad, but conviction is not bad because the result of conviction and the purpose of conviction is that God wants to use conviction to bring us into a right standing and a right relationship with God. That's what conviction is all about. It's not made to put you down. It's not made to keep you feeling bad. Even though conviction shows us how bad we are in ourselves, the purpose of conviction is not just to show you how bad you are, but it's to show you how good God is. Conviction of the Spirit, it has to do with our conversion. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that verse everyone knows, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that all of us are on the same footing. None of us started off higher or lower than the others. We've all come from different backgrounds and different places in life, geographically and socially and all kind of things, levels that determine differences in our appearance, differences, men and women. And we have different financial status in life, but all of us are the same. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That takes in the red and yellow, black and white. That takes in the rich and the poor. That takes in everybody. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And conviction, long before you became a Christian, the Holy Ghost began to convict your heart. And why in the world did it even happen? God didn't have to have anything to do with us. He was in heaven. Everything's perfect up there. Everything's going right up there. Everybody, everything is praising Him up there. He didn't have to have anything to do with us. But the reason that He did is because the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. John three sixteen, And God loved us so much. That's why He sent His Son to the world. That's why He sent out the Holy Ghost to convict our hearts long before we came to Christ, before we thought about God, before we thought about getting right with God, before we thought about getting in church, before we thought about straightening up, before we thought about any of that. The Holy Ghost conviction comes along and He says, You're a sinner. You're living in sin. You're not doing right. You're not living right. You cannot continue living the way you do. If you do, you're going to die and go to hell. God convicts us of our sin long before we were converted. Conviction of the Spirit has to do with our conversion. And then conviction has to do with our conscience. The conscience. I know some people nowadays, it seems like, 
Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They don't have much of a conscience. But God has put within us a conscience. It is a moral sense of right and wrong. It tells you what is right and wrong. Even before you became a Christian, you had a sense of what is right and wrong. Sometimes it's the way you're raised. Sometimes it just comes to you. Abraham was raised in idolatry. He had idolatry all around him. But he wasn't an idol worshiper. Abraham was one who somehow or another, he reached out to God. And he had a heart for God. Yeah, God called him out of the heathen place that he was. But he didn't just call him out in the midst of idolatry. He was in the midst of idolatry, but he himself was not worshiping idols. In fact, there's literature that he begged his father's house. He begged them not to worship idols. He begged them to get right with God, and they wouldn't do it. And God called him out because he could not continue to live where he was. He needed to come out so he could worship God. There's a conscience in every one of us. And John chapter 8 gives a story that the Pharisees had brought this woman who was taken in the very act of adultery, probably a set up, no doubt, by them. And they put her in the midst and said, Moses said that such should be stoned in the law. Well, what do you have to say about it, Jesus? And he said, I'll tell you what I say. He who does not have sin among you, let him first be the one to cast a rock at her. And he stoops down and writes in the sand. I don't know what he wrote exactly, but I can tell you what he wrote. He was writing about their sin. He knew what they were doing. He knew what the lazy snakes was doing, the scandals. He knew what they were all about. He knows the heart of all of us. And he knows what they were doing. He knew what they were doing, and he was writing in the sand. And they were convicted. The scripture said here, chapter 8, verse 9 of John, and they which heard it, Jesus said, if you're without sin, you be the first one to cast a stone at her. They that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even until the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Nobody condemned her. Where are those who are accusing you, lady? Has no man condemned you? No man, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The only one who had the right to condemn her chose not to do it. The only one who has a right to condemn us chooses not to do it. He could condemn us. He could cast us all into hell right now tonight and be justified in doing it. But he chooses not to do it because he convicts us of sin. These people were convicted by their own conscience. And there are people in America and across the nations of the world right now this evening who are convicted in their own conscience. They're out marching, they're out demonstrating, they're out causing trouble, and they know within their heart that they're not doing right. They know that they're going against God, and that's why they're so having such a fit about it, is because they know it's not right. They're kicking against the pricks, they're going against what's right, and they're convicted by their own conscience. And there's also what we call crisis. Crisis has to do with conviction. Crisis is that time that we get into where it may be a special time in life, a specific time in life. It might be a financial crisis. It may be a emotional crisis. It may be a social crisis, an economic crisis. There are all kind of crises that we could talk about. But the crisis that Romans chapter 7 talks about is the crisis that says, I know that I've been changed. I know that there's a difference in my life. I know that the Lord lives in my heart, but I, I want to do right. I want to do good. But it seems like that every time I try to do good, it's one step forward and two or three steps back. I want to do good. I want to please God. And I end up breaking his heart. I end up messing up. I end up falling down. I end up making a mess. And the scripture describes it in Romans 7, 24, in the first part of verse 25. Paul cries out and he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What in the world am I going to do? He says, in other words. And then he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whoo, hallelujah. Praise God. 
We can praise God because Jesus will deliver us. He will not allow you to continue to live in that struggle. We all have struggles, but he doesn't want you to live in that struggle every day where you fight with the old man and there's a continual struggle. He wants to sanctify you and break the power of sin over your life so that you can live a holy life, so that you can be a victorious Christian. God doesn't want you to just barely slide through this world and scrape through and make it in by the skin of your teeth. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to live a victorious Christian life. And God, even our crisis, He will convict us and cause us to cry out to Him, like the apostle said here. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? What in the world am I going to do? God will convict us and bring us to that place that we need to be. And then there's what we call Christian conviction. There is, as Christians, we are convicted... Not because God wants to beat us up, but again, is to bring us into that right and perfect relationship with God. In John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. He will show you which way to go. He will cause you to remember things from the Bible that you didn't even think you know. And it's because of the Holy Ghost. God sends the Holy Ghost to us. We have the Spirit of God in our life now. We're not our own. We don't belong to our own anymore. And God sends the Spirit of God into our life. The Comforter who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, and He did. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. We have a teacher, a built-in teacher. You don't have to go to Vance Granville. You don't have to go to the school. You don't have to go to the college. We have a teacher that's built into us, and He lives with us. You don't don't even have to feed him. You take him home with you and he stays with you every day. Praise God. Hallelujah. You have a teacher. You have a resider. Someone who lives with you all the time and he convicts you not to beat you up, but he convicts you to do you good. He wants to show you how to live. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He makes the things of Jesus real to us. And that's what John chapter 16 verse 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He takes the things of God and reveals them unto us. That's what the Holy Ghost does. And when we as a Christian, we get upset with somebody, we get cross with somebody, somebody hurts our feelings, and we want to fight out or lash out, and the Holy Ghost is there, he comes all of a sudden. We don't even think about it. Well, the Holy Ghost comes and says, uh, 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 don't do that. That. Don't you do that because praise God for the conviction of the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters. Thank God that He keeps me out of trouble. He keeps me in the right way. He keeps me from going down the wrong road. He keeps me from getting into a whole heap of trouble that I can never get out of. It's the conviction of the Holy Ghost. As a Christian, yes, we have the conviction of the Holy Ghost and He will convict you. He will show you. Don't kick against Him. Don't go against Him. Don't put him off. He's a gentle like a child. He's easy to be offended and you don't want to offend him. He's the most wonderful person that you'll ever know. The most wonderful person you'll ever have. Praise God. And God sends you the Holy Ghost to be with you, to comfort you and to teach you and to guide you and to lead you and to speak into your life, into your heart. Somebody said, I just don't know how to hear God. All you got to do is just get your chair and you get somewhere and wait. That's what you do when you get blind when you get disabled, when you get a little older. That's all you can do anyway. You just wait. You just wait on God. And that's what God says do. He didn't say climb a tree. He didn't say jump over a building. He said wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He will strengthen your heart. All we have to do is wait on God and God will come right there with you and before you know it, He'll be right there as it were sitting in that chair with you and He will speak to you. He will show you the Word of God and you'll get up from there feeling a whole lot better all over more than anywhere else. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Now you notice that we're talking about conviction, but not condemnation. There's a big difference in conviction 
condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're walking after the flesh, hanky-panking around, and you're living in open sin, and you don't have no idea of changing, you don't have no mind to change, you're not planning on changing, you don't want to get right with God, then yeah, there's condemnation there because you're not living right. But if you're living for Jesus, even though you make mistakes, even though you sin, even though you come short, you're not condemned. He doesn't condemn you. He doesn't put you down. He knows your heart. He'll convict you. He'll help you. If you lead a little chastising, He'll do that. Sometimes He chastises you with the Word. And if you don't listen to that, sometimes He has to put a little hickory on you and you chastise you that way. But whatever He needs to do, I'd rather for Him to whip me than to have to cast my soul into hell. I'll tell you what. I want to be right with God. I want to go to heaven when I die. And I want to live a victorious life while I'm living for the Lord now. And he said, we don't have to die in sin. We don't have to live in sin. We don't have to be condemned if we are living for Jesus. We're walking in the flesh. And we are, are not living right. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not condemned. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thank God for the conviction of the Spirit. He convicted us before we even came to Christ. He convicted us and brought us to Christ. He convicts us and causes us to be sanctified. He convicts us, causes us to be filled with the Spirit. He convicts us and causes us to live right. And He continues to convict us. He wants us to get us right, to get us ready for heaven. And that's why He convicts you as a Christian. He will continue to convict you. Thank God for the conviction of the Spirit. Father, I want to thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that we have a word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you, Lord, for the anointed preaching of your word. And I thank you for the conviction of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would not turn the heater down, but you'd turn it up. Turn it up on our kids. Turn it up on our grandchildren. Turn it up on this world, this liberal and wicked world that we're living in. Turn up the conviction, Lord, Holy Spirit. Turn up the conviction. And I pray, Lord, the body of Christ, we're living in times when we need to quit playing games and quit entertaining our stinking flesh and, and serving the flesh. We need to get right with God and be right and do right. We need to get ready for heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch us. I pray that you would touch our churches. Oh, God, that's turned over our Sunday nights and turned over our midweek services into socialism, social clubs and ice cream suppers. And Oh God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to get right with God. Put preaching back in the pulpit where it needs to be, Lord. And I pray for the Word of God to take its first place in the house of God. And Lord, in our lives again, and help us, Lord, not to apologize for the gospel, not to apologize for the old-time religion. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Ghost would continue to convict the body of Christ and continue to do it until we find ourselves in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I love you and praise you. And I pray that many souls would come to you, would feel the convicting power and know the convicting power of the Spirit and would come to you and be saved and live for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 